हेलो एवरी वन गुड आफ्टरनून वेलकम टू द वीक सेवन ऑफ प्रॉब्लम सॉल्विंग सेशन फॉर अल्ट्रा फॉर द कोर्स अल्ट्रा फास्ट लेजर स्पेक्ट्रोस्कोपी सो एज द प्रीवियस वीक टूडे ऑल्सो वील बी डिस्कसिंग फ्यू क्वेश्चन विच आर रिलेटेड टू द असाइनमेंट सेवन एंड देर विल बी सम मोर क्वेश्चन विच आई हैव के एज अ पार्ट ऑफ रिविजन क्वेश्चन विच आर फ्रॉम द प्रीवियस असाइनमेंट विच वी हैव कवर्ड Uh, as i can see no one has joined yet so uh, i will wait for some time uh, so that people can uh, join and then we'll start the session okay so i suppose now we should continue our session uh, so uh, this is the session 7 for the course ultra fast laser spectroscopy the course instructor is professor anindya datta from uh, iit bombay and i uh, my hi my name is nikita mahajan so this is uh, the ses session 7 
and mainly in this week we had learned about the how the design of amplifiers is done and how the development uh, towards the modern era that have come that that has come and the third thing we which we started was how uh, the second what are these non linear optical materials what is the process and what are the essential conditions that are required for a material for a uh, to be non uh, to show the non linear optical effect okay so now with this this is the question one for uh, the weekly assignment uh, which is uh, range of the wavelength obtained from alexandrite laser. So, uh, what is the alexandrite laser? This is also one kind of uh, lasers. And uh, this is chromium based solid state laser, uh, which So first of all, uh, the alexandrite lasers, these are the uh, chromium based solid state laser. The main uh, uh, where alexandrite is one of the naturally occurring gemstones. And what happens is uh, the, Alex uh, the alexandrite, this acts as the gain medium while the compound is doped with the chromium plus three ions. The chromium plus three ions, they reside in the cavity of aluminium plus three in the host crystal and the emission wavelength for this crystal lies in the range of 700 to 800 nanometer. So basically alexandrite for the alexandrite lasers where we had studied those, the source or the emission wavelength is in the range of order 700 to 839 nanometer. So uh, this is quite direct question, uh, subjective also and uh, not related to any concept but uh, what we need to learn is what kind of laser alexandrite is so alexandrite is a solid state laser what is the which metal ion is doped in it so chromium is doped with BeL2O4 if we know BeL2O4 is one of the spinels which we had uh, which we cover in the inorganic chemistry the Cr plus 3 ions where does it reside so it resides in the cavity cavity of aluminium plus 3 ions and um, and the emission wavelength for this would be in 700 to 800 nanometer uh, if any one of you have any doubt in this question we can uh, still wait and think over it and or otherwise we'll proceed to the next question So once again, I will repeat what the alexandrite lasers are. Alexandrite lasers, these are solid state lasers which have chromium doped in BeAl2O4 crystal. Uh, alexandrite is one of the naturally occurring material, but what we use for the experiments and for the development of lasers is something which is synthesized artificially. The other thing is the uh, chromium ions, they are... Uh, in the host crystal they uh, take place or they take the position of aluminium plus three ions and moreover the wavelength with which which this emits emits is in the range of 700 to 800 nanometer therefore the answer for this question is option b okay now next And now next we'll go on to the next question. The next question is luminescent concentrators usually utilize. Okay. So what are luminescent concentrators? Actually, as the name suggests, the uh, uh, concentrator is something which is used to concentrate. And from the name itself, we are able to understand that luminescence is something which is, uh, luminescent is something which is related to luminescence.
what kind of luminescence are, have we studied? We have studied fluorescence or phosphorescence. Okay, so uh, basically these topics we have covered earlier. The chirp pulse amplification was a part of week 6 module in which we had studied that uh, like suppose if uh, what is a chub pulse normally if you incident a very high intensity of beam of light on any system with any refractive index what happens suddenly because of the high intensity the the, the light is split into various components for example if it is a single if it has a if it is a beam of say something uh, of a particular range it is split into its components to others okay so this is called as chirping. In the chirp pulse amplification, what we do basically chirping was something which is a drawback. But now we have used it for the amplification of the pulse. Okay, so what they had done in chirp pulse amplification after the uh, beam or the uh, of or the input wave was. Uh, passed through a stretcher through chirping it was just stretched somewhere then after it was amplified and further it was compressed to give something uh, uh, further a beam that was compressed and therefore and further amplified also so these two techniques are something which we had studied in the other previous module which this regenerative amplification which involved a series of mirrors from which through reflection and consecutive reflection, we could amplify the signal. Saturable absorption is something which also we had studied where uh, we use normal the, uh, the dyes which, uh, which are used as the saturable absorbers and total internal reflection. So now, uh, in order to answer this question, first we'll study what luminescent concent concentrators are. So luminescent concentrators are uh, something like uh, uh, suppose uh, this is this is a cube this is a cuboidal cavity. Okay, now what you do initially is uh, you use a pump light. Okay, from the surface uh, this pump light it is there are some you can say uh, materials which are on the surface. Okay which are on this light green portion here okay so as you pump light inside inside which light up there are some emitters which are highlighted by this orange color okay so as this light is pumped in the something which is on the wall the this glows up and which which is used to excite these luminophores okay so as these luminophores are excited uh, as a result of uh, the because of the emission this luminophore emits in all the directions okay and when this light is emitted in all the directions you will see that because of this wall it has a low density and something which is inside these or this medium has a higher density okay and one more one more phenomenon which we had studied was when light ray when when it say ldi am denoting with uh, a, a, a low density am denoting with ld and high density am denoting with uh, hd so when light light passes from high density medium to a low density medium it moves away from the normal okay so it is refracted again away from the normal see this is the angle of incidence this is the angle of refraction and when this goes on further when it goes from rarer medium to rarer medium there comes a point where from the when it gets reflected refracted sorry from a high density medium to a low density medium see, since it is refracting more and more some at some time it will be refracted at this angle and further if the density is lower it will undergo total internal reflection that is from the high density medium it will move away from the normal to such an extent that it will be refracted to 
the high density medium, density medium itself this phenomenon is called as total internal reflection and the same process was same process or the same phenomenon is used here see you can see from here as the light goes from this denser medium to this rarer medium because of this rarer medium it again gets totally in total internally reflected because of which it moves here then again after striking to this point it again moves in the same medium to this direction Fro then again from here to here it moves here and then again is reflected in the same medium this process continues for a longer time and this process is, is what happens when the light of sufficient becomes concentrated itself how does it happen because it is reflected uh, sorry it is total internally reflected within the same medium because of which the amplification occurs and then we get a concentrated light outside from a single point not even from the other points there is a single small aperture through a small aperture through which the light goes and this is how this process works and this is why luminescent concentrators are used for amplification also so basically what we discussed say this is a cuboidal what are luminescent concentrators luminescent concentrators are some which are used to concentrate the luminescent or light okay so first of all for uh, uh, emitting them for them to emit light we need a pump light this pump light is used is incident on the wall of this cavity as it is incident there is a material which is coated on the walls okay and which emits in uh, which emits some uh, wavelength of light within the medium this medium is further a high density medium which is filled with some luminophores these luminophores as a result of absorption they emit certain certain amount of light okay and because of this emission since we know that emission is in all the directions what happens is they emit in all the directions and therefore when this uh, uh, this medium in which the luminophores are there this medium is a high density medium while the medium which is on the walls this is a low density medium what happens is when this light of sufficiently which is emitted by the luminophore it strikes this wall it is total internally reflected to another direction within the same medium why because as i had explained when light passes from a high density medium to the low density medium it gets refracted away from the normal when you when the density continues to decrease to a low, further lower density it will move further away from the normal sometime it can move perpendicular or towards and then further if the density is reduced uh, the process may so occur that from the high density medium the light is reflected back in the same medium actually here the arrow is wrong the light will will not go to the low density medium it will be reflected in the high density medium itself okay this process is called as total internal reflection which happens to be in the cavity because of the dif density difference that is high density and low density so the parameters you fix such that the within this cavity of luminescent concentrator total internal reflections occur multiple times as you pump and not even from the same side you pump the light from both the sides this whole surface which we are seeing which has h the height w the breadth and l the length this whole is concentrated or this whole is covered with something you can say a surface which is covered by with something which is used to excite these uh, luminophores which are set up inside the cavity okay and what happens is because of this total internal reflection and multiple reflection the amplification occurs and therefore what comes out is quite concentrated high intensity light also the thing to notice 
uh, throughout this cavity, this larger cavity, there is only single aperture from which this entire light will pass. Okay. So basically, what is luminescent concentrators? What do they utilize? Chubbed pulse, chubbed pulse amplification is itself a process which involves these many steps and saturated absorption absorption is something which we have covered in the previous uh, weeks but this is not the process the answer to this question is total internal reflection one more thing to know there are few points to note for the luminescent concentrators first the luminophore should have high quantum yield the second thing is c the density difference and the total internal reflection okay there is a single aperture or single aperture for the output the third is total internal reflection is an important phenomenon which on the principle of which only this luminescent concentrators work okay and the luminophores which we are talking about can be any Luminophores means something. Here I'll write luminophores means something that undergoes photoluminescence or that shows. photo luminescence okay so uh, i'll just rub this and so that the diagram is quite clear to you and we can if you have any doubts you can just ask yeah so if you want uh, uh, or else i'll repeat this process or uh, the principle of luminescent concentrators again luminescent concentrators are some devices which are used for the uh, for concentrating the light or say increasing the or amplifying it increasing the intensity basically what they do is there is a cavity you have a pump light there are two main components which are inside first of all is see on the surface there is something which is uh, the which which is you which just lightens up okay which provides the source of light to these luminophores so this is one side and this is the other side from both the side the light is pumping the second thing what happens is as this lighten up something that is on the wall that lightens up what happens is inside there are few luminophores not few the whole cavity is filled with some luminophores these luminophores because uh, as their property of photoluminescence because of this light they absorb this amount of uh, they absorb this light and therefore show photoluminescence for example, this is absorbing somewhere in 380, it would be emitting somewhere in uh, around 400 to 500 or somewhere. 
the essential phenom the essential point to note is luminophore which is filled this whole medium is a high density medium second thing this luminophores have are something which have a high quantum yield of phi almost equal to 1 second thing the third thing is uh, as this light is pumped in these luminophores these light and up they show photoluminescence the photoluminescence or the light which is emitted by this luminophores is emitted in all the direction and as the strikes the walls of the container or the walls of this cavity the to this has a low density while this medium is of high density when the light tries to pass through it it undergoes total internal reflection which is a process which i explained that when the light passes from a high density medium to a low density medium it passes away from the normal somewhere it happens so that when the light passes from high density to low density the density is such lower that it retraces or it moves in the same direction or in the same space or towards the high density itself why because it it was supposed to be in this medium but it is deflected to such a high angle that it is if it is to call to be as total internally reflected in the same medium as this process occurs the light or this light which is emitted from a single uh, luminophore in different direction undergoes multiple total internal reflections within the cavity because of this multiple total internal reflection reflections what happens is the amplification or the increase in intensity that is what the thing these luminescent concentrators do do as the light is pumped in which uh, the other molecules within the cavity they they get excited and further due to this excitation they undergo total internal reflection and with from the cavity out of the cavity there is only a single aperture from which the light will be emitted out okay and this is how these luminescent concentrators work the answer to this question were, was like uh, Quachum pulse amplification, regenerative amplification, saturable absorption, or total internal reflection. Luminescent concentrators utilize which process? So the answer to this question was total internal reflection. Okay. Now we'll go on to the next question, which is question number three. Question number three is non-linear amplified loop mirrors find use in. Okay, so in alexandrite laser, titanium sapphire laser, ultrafast fiber laser, or dye laser. Dye laser, which we studied, was in was rhodamine six G or DODCI laser. The second is ultrafast fiber laser. So ultrafast fiber laser is something which we had discussed in this week's course. Titanium sapphire laser and alexandrite laser. Alexandrite laser is these two are also example of solid state laser, which include which use the some of the ancient gemstones like uh, uh, alexandrite and sapphire, and which are doped with some metals. For example, here it is doped with chromium plus three, and here it is doped with titanium. So these are also some solid state laser, which which are the old and traditional ones. Okay, alexandrite is something which is developed uh, after titanium sapphire, but uh, quite some time. Now, uh, what is no not known to is us is ultrafast fiber laser, which is something like this. So ultrafast laser is a fiber lasers as the name suggests fibers it uses the fibers as the medium uh, looking towards it uh, like it uh, appears to be like a simple system with only optical fibers which it is covering which are uh, like say made up of some material which allow the light to pass or propagate through it so basically ultrafast fiber laser as you uh, we can see there is an input of and what the numbers written here are the wavelength. So as the light is input through it, it uh, goes through wavelength division uh, multi multiplexer. Something of 980 nanometer passes through this yeah, YB fiber and then further it moves through the system. What happens here is amplification and uh, the 
polarization of the light is maintained as it passes through this and this is the point from where the laser comes out okay what happens here is this 60 to 40 coupler from here it moves to this uh, system so basically this system which is called as the non-linear amplifying loop mirror NALM this is used for the mode locking purposes what is mode locking mode locking is like if a pulse is there it should it has a certain range of light and uh, it is quite uh, mode lock means it uh, uh, they are of high intensity and therefore in a specific range also somewhere you will see here there is another wavelength division multiplier from here also 980 130 input is done which use is used for the amplification and mode locking here is where the mode locking happens and amplification also from here it moves through here 60 40 coupler from where the 40 percent of the light it goes here and the rest 60 percent it goes out then from this also in this 80 20 coupler only uh, the 80 percent of light it moves out and the rest 20 percent again moves into the cavity so basically ultra fast lasers first of all these are the modern uh, systems second which use which use optical fibers third these are compact fourth cost friendly then also they are economic okay and uh, the non linear amplifying loop mirror this is something which is used for this which is used in these ultra fast fiber laser there are some other things like isolator yb fibers and these couplers which are also used but what we want to learn is the non-linear amplifier, non-linear loop amplifier, amplifier NALM is something which is used in these ultra fast fiber lasers. Why they are, why the term fiber is used? Because they make use of these optical fibers. What is the purpose? 980 to 1030 nanometer and nanometer. This stands for the wavelength, which is input, passes through this YB fiber. Uh, the YB fiber, these act as the amplifying units. Then it passes through the isolator. After this, this light is further, which comes from here, is divided to two parts, 60 to 40. Only 40% part goes out, the 60% part comes here. The other thing is when it passes through this interbium uh, YB fiber, again, um, again uh, something which is 980 to 1030 light is input from this corner, which is used for the amplification as the light passes through this uh, whole system through the non-linear amplifying loop mirror also. We can see this is something which is say this like coiled structure, okay which is coiled and when light passes through this whole system uh, it is amplified and more long okay so uh, uh, further when it goes out it passes through this 80 20 coupler from where the only 80 percent light goes out and the rest 20 percent is still fit, uh, is allowed to pass in the medium okay so basically uh, uh if you uh the ultra fast lasers are the modern lasers the other lasers which we have studied are alexandrite laser uh, which is a chromium doped uh, uh, b2 L A L A 4 type laser b a l2 i'm sorry b e a l2 type laser uh then titanium sapphire laser this also we have studied earlier dye laser which include the examples of rhodamine 6 g and dod ci laser which we had studied in earlier case in uh, the week six also uh, the conclusion is uh, we wanted to learn where are these non-linear amplified loop mirrors used so these are used in the ultra fast fiber laser okay if you have any doubt in this question uh, you can just ask or else we'll go to the next question
okay so we'll go proceed to the next question which is question number 4 phase matching condition for second harmonic generation is about the conservation of okay so first of all phase matching condition what uh, is this and uh, the second new term here is second harmonic generation so second harmonic generation is um, first of all second and the other term is harmonic harmonic is something related to the frequency and generation is something which is generated so what is the phase matching condition uh, so uh, first of all for this uh, let us see what is second harmonic generation so second harmonic generation refers to Okay, second harmonic generation is a non-linear optical phenomenon. Okay, so in the non-linear optical phenomena, what do you mean by this non-linear optical phenomenon? So first, for the learning non-linear, we need to learn what is linear optical phenomenon. A linear optical response. Okay. So we know that light has two components, or any form of energy has electric field and magnetic field. Here we are talking about the electric field. So basically, if you apply electric field on any material, there happens to be polarization. What happens is polarization. So in the what does this polarization mean polarization means say this is the for a single atom if i talk about this is the nuclei and this is the electron cloud around it okay so as you apply electric field over it there is a distortion suppose we consider it to be a spherical field the distortion changes it to non spherical Okay, we cannot say it is particularly elliptical or not, but it becomes non spherical. Polarization means uh, the distortion in the electron cloud as a consequence of. electric field okay so uh, giving it a mathematical relation we can say that polarization is equals to chi into e what is this chi this chi is the electrical susceptibility okay so uh, what about this second harmonic generation what happens is the electric field component is something which affects the most okay say uh, some where somewhere we when we say that the polarization is directly proportional to the first power of electric field and susceptibility then this thing is called as the linear response but what happens in some materials, the response is not linear. So what we see is that the total polarization is equal to chi 1 and first power of the electric field plus it is the sum of chi of second order multiplied by the its square plus chi third order multiplied by E naught cube. Okay. So, this is something which is new to us. Okay. And uh, the second thing is, uh, what uh, we want to say is, what is this chi 2 and chi 3? So, what we called it as the, uh, this is called as the polarizability, uh, high, um, electrical susceptibility, susceptibility. The other things, these are called the uh, second order and third order susceptibilities. 
so in the second harmonic generation happens somewhere where uh, in terms of frequency if you talk about say this is a system where you input a light of frequency omega over this system and what comes out is something which is double or it of it or say if you input light of frequency omega 1 and omega 2 to it omega 1 comma omega 2 to it what you get out as the output is sum of these two okay so in shortly we in short we'll also discuss what is this omega 1 and omega 2 and how does this happen and then we'll come out to what is phase matching okay so i'll take another page Okay. Yeah. So, uh, consider a system which is in ground state. Okay. Now, what happens is uh, you input it with a light of frequency omega. Okay, now its uh, original or the other excited state, it has somewhere where the frequency is 2 omega. What it does is, since it has a higher intensity, it goes first to some virtual state. From this virtual state, it again absorbs the intensity or frequency of light omega and then reaches to a higher state, that is this state, which and from here this state since it has absorbed two frequency of this omega and omega it what it emits now is of total frequency to omega okay so again i'll repeat what has happened say the intensity of the light is quite intense uh, it has uh, the number of photons is quite high initially what happens is say a photon of frequency omega has incident on the system when it has incident on this system it uh, it does not it has some higher energy level which and the energy gap between two is two omega so it reaches somewhere in a virtual state then from the virtual state immediately again a new photon comes which has frequency uh, omega uh, also and then it is totally excited from this virtual state to a higher state that is this say this is ground state this is excited state and uh, this light is uh, which is emitted that has frequency of 2 omega 2 omega means frequency double the same phenomenon can occur in other way say there is a system this ground state you incident a photon which has frequency omega 1 Although it is a higher intense state, it reaches to some virtual state and from the virtual state again by absorbing somewhere in the a new photon comes which has a frequency of omega 2, it reaches to further higher state and now what it emits is the sum of omega 1 plus omega 2. So not only frequency doubling occurs, some frequency generation also occurs. Okay. And uh, now we will see what is the reason for this. Okay. So this is something which non-linear response which is given by some materials. Uh, the two properties uh, which they must contain is lack of centrosymmetry. They should not be centrally symmetric. Okay. And the second thing is they should uh, because of this they should also show by refringence okay what they should show they should be by refringent what does that by what do you mean by by refringence by refringence means 
suppose you have a medium when you pass the light through this some of the light it goes straight through this way but some of the light is deflected this is called as the ordinary ray and the one which is deflected from its path is called the extraordinary ray okay since it is not the or ordinary one as the name suggests now uh, uh talking about this in terms of the electric field or the total polarization what we can say is the total polarization and say the polar uh, the electric field can be given as e naught cos k r minus omega t what is this k this k is wave vector r is the position and omega is the angular frequency and t is the time so e can be written as a function of position and time uh, like this when you talk about the polarization or say second order polarization p of order 2 i write here like this so this can be written as the square of this and therefore when you expand it when you expand it you write it to be like chi chi to the power 2 e not square by 2 plus 1 by 2 chi ki chi to chi of second order multiplied by e not of second order and again i write this expression to be here cos 2 k 1 r minus omega 2 t okay and now here we get to know that uh the total polarization uh, it has the frequency of 2 omega and it depends on the e not value okay so the phase mass matching condition is something necessary for the second harmonic generation okay so what is this phase matching condition this phase matching condition says that the product that is k3 which is the wave vector of the emitted light to omega multiplied by omega 3 is equals to k1 the wave vector of omega 1 plus k2 omega 2. okay so from this okay so here we got to know that the phase matching condition is one of the situation or the condition which is necessary for the second harmonic generation uh one more thing is uh, which we want to say is this uh, k3 and p3 uh, k3 and omega3 here c there is one more relation p is equals to h cut into k this k is the same here now as we say that the k3 is the sum of k1 omega 1 plus k2 omega 2 we can also say that in this case the total momentum will be like p3 will be the sum of the total therefore the total momentum will remain conserved okay so the whole uh, condition is or the whole uh, concept is when you talk about first of all the polarization in terms of this this is just an equation to derive the total second order non polarization and the other thing is if uh, you want the material or or the medium to be non linear optically active uh the the three 
they should follow the incident and the ref, uh, final or the output beam should follow a phase matching condition that is the sum of the two individual wave vector multiplied by the frequency should be equal to the uh, final or the emitted um, wave, ve uh, wave vector uh, should be equal to the product of wave vector and the angular frequency in the case of excited or the emitted wave. Okay, so uh, the phase matching condition for the second harmonic generation is about the conservation of what? Energy, polarization, momentum, polarization or direction of propagation. Okay. So, uh, talking about this, the direction of propagation we will study later that it is not the same. Second, polarization. If you talk about the polarization, the polarization is not conserved. We will uh, we'll also get to know later that the uh, polarization of the emitted beam is not the same as that of the incident beam. The incident beam and the, the reflected beam or the output beam has a polarization that is just perpendicular to that of the input beam. So in all the polarization is not conserved. See, this is the input beam. So what the polarization will be the uh, other. The uh, formula which we derived and the phase matching condition which it follows according to that only we deduce that if this is the we talk, what we talk about the linear momentum case for any wave, we can say that it uh, from this relation only we can say that the phase matching condition for the in the phase matching condition uh, for the second harmonic generation uh, the conservation of momentum occurs which we can get from this relation as the p is equals to h cut into k where k is the wave vector and h cut is the h means Planck's constant divided by 2 pi okay so if you have any doubt in this question feel free to ask or else we'll proceed to the next question Okay, so we'll proceed to the next question. The next question is question number five. Question number five says that the intensity of the second harmonic light is given by, first of all, uh, the second harmonic light, what, uh, uh, on what factors does it depend? So, as you, we, can say that since one of the factors which is important is the intensity of the incident light and the uh, other factor is what is the magnitude of this second order magnetic uh, electric susceptibility not magnetic susceptibility so this was a simple expression which we had studied and uh, the value for this was intensity of the two omega light is equals to k which is a constant the second order susceptibility this two in the bracket actually it is not for the square it is for denoting the second order phenomenon square is written somewhere outside the bracket multiplied by l square l is equals to length of the 
medium. Then comes the third, that is sine delta k l by 2 whole upon delta k l by 2 whole square multiplied by i naught square of frequency omega. Okay. So basically it depends on the intensity of the incident line, length of the crystal, the electric susceptibility of any order. From these expression, from this expression, what can we get that which is the correct option for this? Here they have written delta KL by 2 in the numerator. So this cannot be the right option. Here they have written sine delta KL by 2 and delta KL by 2, which seems to be correct and similar to this. But the only difference is the LQ. Okay. So here uh, there is a simple uh, trick to uh, uh, learn this uh, formula. Is everything in this formula is in terms of square. Okay. Even the length is square. So if you want to like learn this formula easily, we can say or learn just look or observe that all the things are just the square and not the cube. So this is also not the right answer. The other thing is here in this, this sign factor is also cube, which is also not the right answer. So these three options, eliminating these three, we have this A option, which is the right option to this. Again, in brief, I would like to explain what uh, was the process of second order nonlinear optical phenomenon and uh, what are the things that affect it and why is the need of a bri refringent crystal in the process of second order nonlinear process, nonlinear optical process. So first of all, second harmonic is something like, say, this is a medium through which the light pass so if you uh, incident a light of frequency omega over it light of frequency 2 omega will come out now in terms of wavelength if i talk about if i incident it with frequency 2 lambda say the lambda is reduced to half so this so happens now suppose i incident with the uh, incident it with the 1040 nanometer of light 1040 nanometer of light what i get will be half of 1040 so 1040 by 2 equals to 520 nanometer okay so this is the main principle it is quite easy and a uh, like easy process Although we cannot say that the totally what is 1040 will give out 520 nanometer itself. Whole conversion does not occur, although some conversion occurs. Okay. What we wanted to, what are the other things? Not all the materials, they show this property of nonlinear optical. First of all, the important thing they should have is non-centrosymmetry. Okay. Non-centrosymmetry in the crystal structure means they should not possess I that is the center of symmetry. Or if we, they possess their arrangement should be non-centrosymmetry. So what is the thing that is, uh, is non-centrosymmetrical arrangement? What is the point? The non-centrosymmetric arrangement. Then uh, the second thing is it should have shown the property of bi refringence. Okay. So, what is bi refringence? That also we had discussed, not in detail, but here we can uh, give it some time. Suppose this is a medium. When light of certain intensity passes through it, some part of the light just goes straight okay as it is incident this light ray we can call it as ordinary ray the other part of light with respect to some optical axis see this optical axis is
is noted as z the other part of light it will get it will not it will go it will not go straight it will go somewhere like this and just move out so this is the extra ordinary ray in short this is called as the o ray and this one is called as the e ray okay now why this birefringence is needed birefringence is needed because uh first of all say with the respect to the angle of incidence say with respect to optical axis this is the angle of incident with respect to it say theta so this extraordinary ray of light that does not happen that when it and if the incidence at an every angle it will have a lower or higher refractive index or their change in the refractive index it so happens that at certain refractive index the at certain angle the for the ordinary ray and the uh, extraordinary ray the refractive index that does not change from no okay so with respect to the optical axis if for the ordinary if i plot say this is the optical axis the value of no remains constant at all the angles so this is a plot of the angles say these are the various angles throughout the circle with respect to the optical axis the no remains constant but the extraordinary ray only at two points only at two points say this point and this point with respect to optical axis it will have a value that is equal to the no of refractive index so rest of all at two points with respect to the optical axis that is 0 degree and 180 degree the no is equals to ne and no and any what do they mean no means the refractive index in the optical medium uh, sorry in refractive index for the ordinary ray and any is equals to refractive index for the extraordinary ray or for the e ray so what happens suppose i consider this the for a non linear optical medium say if the ne is of lower value than no you can say this is the case now what happens is when you talk about the intensity or say the refractive index of the second harmonic uh, or the frequency doubled wave so it will have somewhere refractive index which is lower than this and the same way that refractive index uh, it will also undergo two phenomenon that is the ordinary ray and e ray say for the ordinary ray i draw a circle like this and for the extraordinary ray it is an eclipse which goes like this so we get 1 2 3 and 4 points across this circle where the values of this okay i'll draw this diagram more clear say this is the z axis okay and this is a circle what is circle denotes this circle denotes the change in refractive index of the ordinary ray with the change in angle of incidence so this is prop, uh, the polar plot with respect to the z axis and the refractive index so see it has a constant value no at all so the radius for this is the radius for this circle is no this i am denoting the second thing is there are only two points that is 0 0 at 0 degree and 180 degree with respect to z axis where no equal to ne happens okay where the Uh, refractive index of the ordinary ray and the extraordinary ray meet so these are the two points rest all it its value say is less than no so it gives some eclipse structure okay now the other case i am studying this is for the incident ray say of frequency omega or omega somewhere i am talking now about the the Uh, intensity in terms of frequency sorry the freq uh, the frequency about the, of the 
emitted or the second harmonic light so first of all it will also have two the because this whole crystal is something which is bi refringent the say the refractive index of the ordinary ray is unchanged so the refractive index of the ordinary ray will be say lesser than the value of no but it will be again i yeah so it will be like a circle okay and what is this this is refractive index of the ordinary ray for the emitted light so this is a circle and again if i talk about the this is the no for 2 omega wali light and the, if i talk about the extraordinary ray it will also follow the same the extraordinary ray will be say at two angles and it will also follow this eclipse kind of pattern basically if i talk about this eclipse of the first and the eclipse of the second which is we'll get that there are four points at which at which the refractive index are same for both for what for uh, for the refractive we see here i'll write at this point refractive refractive index of first the e ray of a light equal to o ray of two omega light okay and this is uh, how we can say that at these four points we can uh, we can say that somewhere the frequency will match and therefore they have a common refractive index okay this property of bi refringence is also something needed that is for the second harmonic light okay and uh, so in all what we can say that the intensity of the second harmonic light is give is given by this relation and what are the two factors or more factors which are two among two most important factors for the second harmonic generation is the crystal system should have non central symmetry and the crystal should be a bi refringent type of crystal okay so with this in this question if you have any doubt we can wait or else we'll proceed to the next question and what does this uh, what does this uh, crossing denote they, it denotes that there there are four phase matching condition and why is this phase matching condition necessary this we had studied in the last question previous question that phase matching condition is the one which is necessary for that which follows the conservation of momentum and which is responsible or which is one of the necessary element for the non linear optical response okay
uh, okay so we'll proceed to the next question which is refractive index depends on angle of incidence for both ordinary ray and incident extraordinary ray neither ordinary nor the extraordinary ray extraordinary ray but not ordinary ray ordinary ray but not extraordinary ray so first of all here the question is incomplete if we without we write refractive index or depends on angle of incidence for a birefringent crystal they are talking about okay so a so for a birefringent crystal as i had drawn this was a simple diagram which was the best way to explain what the phenomenon of birefringence is with respect to the optical axis if you talk about the ordinary ray it will go straight and therefore it's the refractive index there will be no change in the refractive index for the ordinary ray say o ray but for an extraordinary ray so happens that when you pass the light along the see along the z axis only or the optical axis only the right gets deviated from the path second thing the refractive index for any changes and this angle uh, this change in the any the change in ne what is any refractive index of e ray depends on the angle of incidence okay one more thing to discuss here is that is quite important also say if you talk about no and any no is not equal to any okay but there are two possibilities first the no can be greater than any and equal to any or no can be lesser than equal to any the possibility the first case where no or the refractive index of the ordinary ray is greater than the uh, ne this is called as the negative crystal and if the refractive index of the extraordinary ray is greater than or equal to the refractive index of the ordinary ray then it is called as the positive crystal also the positive crystal and the negative crystal now we also want to know that what is the variation in the value of ne how does it change so for this uh, we have earlier also drawn a diagram or that is a polar plot with respect to the angle of incidence so first relation we can write that that no or i'll write in the small no remains unchanged with respect to angle of incidence along z axis so how does it look like if this is the z axis see this i have denoted as z axis the no will remain unchanged so it will give us sphere why because the radius the radius of this circle this radius of this circle is the value of no and since this no is constant it will give a circle which has a radius of no the second thing is suppose i say suppose i say 
the variation of NO, NE. So any changes with respect to angle of incidence, say greater or smaller. And second, third thing which again is important is only at two angles the value of NO equal to NE that to add 0 degree and 180 degree with respect to optical axis or Z axis. Okay. So with respect to Z axis, now say I'm drawing the first case where NE is greater than NO. Now any value is not constant. See, this is the angle of 0 degree and this is the 180 degree. So it shows something like Okay, so NO is in all these cases, the value follows NO is greater than any only at these two points, any will be equal to NO. So this I will write at this and the plot will be like the polar plot will come out to be not a circle, but an eclipse. The second case is if NO, NE is less than NO. Now you can predict the, uh, the plot yourself and we can just say that this is the same angle NE and NO where NE and NO are equal. The other thing that should be noted as NE has all the values lesser than NO. So in the other cases it will form an eclipse like structure which will be like this. Okay. The first case, wait. The first case is called to be as the, oh, the, this case is called to be as the negative crystal. And the, this is called to be as the positive test. Okay. Now, uh, what are the options they have given? Actually, the option is a bit uh, like a word because of this. So, I just rub here. Write it somewhere else. Uh-oh. So, this is the case of a negative crystal. What are the options they have given here? Refractive index depends on angle of incidence for ordinary ray, extraordinary ray, neither ordinary. So, here from this relation we can say that First of all, yeah. for ordinary ray, NO is constant giving this green colored sphere, uh, sorry, circle. So, this is not the right answer. Neither ordinary nor extraordinary, this is also not the right answer. Extraordinary but not the ordinary ray, this is the right answer because refractive index depends on angle of incidence only for the uh, this extraordinary ray. Okay. Now, if you have any doubt in this question, uh, take your time and just ask your doubts or else we'll proceed to the next question.
okay so we will proceed to the next question that is okay so uh, actually this question for this question we have already dis already discussed in the previous questions what are the necessary conditions for second harmonic generation So basically for the second harmonic generation, we uh, got to know that there should be a phase matching condition. What does this phase matching condition mean? Phase matching condition means that the total momentum should be conserved and the sum of the product of wave vector multiplied by angular frequency for the uh, output wave that is K3 into omega 3 should be equal to K1 omega 1 plus k2 omega 2 okay also if you write this in terms of uh, like suppose you talk about the collinear beams we can also say that the refractive index total refractive index or say the n3 into omega 3 should also be equal to n1 into omega 1 plus n2 into omega 2 okay so this is getting and other thing which we discussed is first of all the birefringence what is the birefringence we have already discussed the in detail in the previous questions so first of all non centro symmetry non centro symmetry something like no center of symmetry or lack of center of symmetry. These are, this is also one of the essential conditions. What do you mean by uh, presence of multiple optic axes? So uh, this is not a condition. We had studied that the, uh, through a single optic axis, if we talk about the refractive index should be changed for the medium with respect to the angle of incidence. So this is not the right option and photochromaticity is not the, also not the right option. Okay. So if you have any doubt in the previous questions which is which are connected to this question also you can ask or else we'll go to the next question which is the question number eight Achha, one more uh, point uh, to discuss here was that uh, what what is the polarization of the uh, output beam and with respect to the incident beam so the thing to note was uh, first uh, suppose i incident the light uh, through the crystal which is vertically pol vertically polarized this is the crystal which is the second harmonic generating material sg crystal and when the light passes through it becomes horizontally polarized that is change in polarization occurs if the light undergoes a non linear optical phenomenon 
one more thing is this by reference and non central symmetry why this non central symmetry is because of this non central symmetry only this value of chi2 changes in the earlier formula which we had written was that the intensity of the two omega beam that comes out depends on two factors that is chi uh, the electric susceptibility its square the l square and intensity of the here was something like sine uh, delta k l by 2 upon delta k l by 2 whole square and here it was e naught square and uh, multiplied by intensity of the not this wasn't there here it was k intensity of the light with frequency omega and its square so basically we want to know that what uh, we got to know from this formula that electric susceptibility or the second order electric susceptibility is something on which the intensity of this output beam depends for the second order or chi2 value to be high non centro symmetry is the essential parameter okay so for non centro uh, because of this non centro symmetry only the chi2 or the electric susceptibility second order electric susceptibility will be high also this uh, since this has some relation with the chi1 the greater will be the value of e not from the linear relation, the more will be the E0 value, the more will be the chi2 value. Okay. So, non centro symmetry is one of the necessary factors and by reference and the intensity of the final beam or the output beam also is also affected by this um, second order electric susceptibility, which is further, uh, which further depends on the value of this. Uh, e naught which is the electric field component of the incident beam okay so uh, this is question number seven and uh, we have also studied what is second harmonic generation change in polarization and the other things if you have any doubt in this question or the previous question still you can ask Hello, welcome Adrija. Is my voice audible to you? Yeah, your voice is audible. Okay, so uh, if you do not have any doubt, we'll go to the next question, question number three. The angle between the polarization of the fundamental and the second harmonic beams is. So uh, this thing also, uh, uh, we had discussed in the previous questions the point was uh, there is a change in the polarization of the fundamental beam and the second harmonic beam the point is when they say this is a shg crystal second harmonic crystal i have denoted it as shg there is an incident light which has frequency omega and when it passes through it, the frequency is doubled to 2 omega. If it is second harmonic generator, then only the frequency B will be doubled. Okay. Uh, or else the frequency cannot uh, can be tripled as well. It, it's not necessary the, that the frequency will be doubled. You can get 3 omega also. But uh, actually the intensity is quite less. So we only like because the further intensity depends on the values of chi 2 chi 3 also okay so first here see from omega to 2 omega the conversion that is happening it also uh, this conversion is also accompanied by further a change that is the change in the polarization suppose the light is vertically polarized The change which happens changes the polarization to this. Okay. 90 degree. So the angle between the polarization of the fundamental and the uh, second harmonic beam is of 90 degree. Okay. And uh, 
one more thing is uh, not uh, the or not all the light which is incident is converted to two omega. The efficiency is not a hundred percent. It is somewhere less than that. Okay, and uh, that is it. Okay, so now it is uh, all the assignment questions are over. But uh, there are few other questions which I have kept as um, some extra questions from the same topic which we covered in week uh, 7. So the first question is, okay, the numbering is I think wrong. So this is que not question number 10, this is question number 9. So what is the function of a second harmonic generator? So uh, what is the function of a second harmonic generator? First option is half the frequency, triples the frequency, double the frequency, or changes the electric field. Okay. So, uh, mm, uh, do you, uh, does anyone have the answer for this question? I think it will Easy. be double the frequency. Yeah. So, it's quite easy question. So uh, basically the second harmonic generator, it doubles the frequency, but although uh, there may be, there are some processes where we can get the, uh, uh, from omega, we can get the three times of omega or tripling of the frequency can also occur, but the intensity or the is will be quite less. So if we talk about the same uh, second harmonic generation in terms of wavelength, can you predict what would be the relation? A wavelength will become half. Yeah. So suppose I have, I uh, get, give an input beam of 1020 nanometer wavelength. What will I get as the output? 510 nanometer. Yeah. So that would be around 510 nanometer. Okay. So your answer is correct. So this was quite easy question, but maybe somewhere you can be asked that if there is a second harmonic generating material and uh, it you input a frequency of, uh, sorry, a wavelength of 1020 nanometer from the source, then what would be the frequency of the output beam? Then second thing related to this is what would be the polarization and also we can be asked that like uh, we had also studied that what are the positive and the negative crystals also based on the briar effringent behavior of that medium. Okay, the other thing is for a second harmonic generator there can also be some frequency generation. Here we talked about that uh, say uh, from the frequency omega, the frequency is double to 2 omega or say 3 omega. But there can be, it can be so that suppose you have incident of frequency of photon or the photon of frequency omega 1 and the second photon of frequency omega 2, something which you get in the output will be the sum of omega 1 and omega 2. So this will be studying further in a more elaborate way in the next week module. But uh, uh, for uh, this particular time, we can also say that nonlinear optical materials or the second harmonic generators can also uh, undergo some frequency generation. And so far, if you remember, some frequency generation is something which we have studied in the previous modules also, where omega 1 and omega 2 were summed up to get omega 1 plus 2. And uh, if you have any doubt in this question, you can ask or else we'll go to the next question. Okay, so we'll go to the next question. This is question number 10. That is, uh, okay, this question is repeated. Yeah, this, this is the next question. Which of this uh, which of this uh, these is an example of a non-linear optical material? Beta barium borate, BBO, potassium dihydrogen, that is KDP, potassium titanyl phosphate, KTP, or lithium niobate. 
actually if you remember bbo is something also which we have studied earlier which was the material which we had used for the second harmony generation okay so uh, although if you do not remember we will cover this in the next weeks and take it as a revision where we have used second harmonic generate second harmonic generating material earlier uh, but uh, do can you just guess the answer to this question Hello, welcome Ajay. Okay, so uh, yeah, so uh, the question was which of these is an example of a non linear optical material? Uh, the uh, question, uh, the options given were beta barium borate BBO, potassium dihydrogen KDP, potassium titanyl phosphate KTP, and lithium niobate. So the answer to this question is all of these are the example of the second harmonic materials. Okay. Uh, this is just for the information. Uh, these are all the inorganic materials. which we have been using as the conventional second harmonic generators. Okay, so for this, uh, all are the answers, beta barium borate, potassium dihydrogen, potassium titanyl phosphate and lithium niobate. All of these are the example for a non-linear optical material. Okay, so with this, we'll go on to the next question. Uh, actually, uh, these are some questions which I have kept from the previous, uh, sorry, previous assignments. So, uh, we'll be discussing these questions as well uh, since we have some time left. And uh, we can get a quick revision to the previous parts which we have covered. So, first of all, this is a question from assignment zero. The wave number for a transition of ground state to excited state is 30,000 centimeter inverse. What region of the electromagnetic spectrum does this correspond to? Okay. First of all, uh, talking in terms of uh, wave number, wave number E is directly proportional to something that is called as energy. Okay. Now, uh, if you want to talk about frequency, E is equals to H nu as we know that. And we have been studying this earlier. So, uh, th basically 30,000 centimeter inverse, uh, since I am more comfortable uh, or most of the people are more comfortable or by discussing this in terms of the uh, wavelength. So, just uh, for the knowledge pur purpose, we'll convert this to wavelength and then we'll just see which region does in this correspond to. So say, yeah. In order to for this to convert this thirty thousand centimeter inverse to wavelength, what we'll do is just just take the reciprocal of one upon thirty into ten to the power. Say I've written three. So and the, since this is centimeter inverse, it will convert to centimeter. This will be ten to the power minus three is 1 upon 30 okay now uh, 
basically uh, we have been studying this in term so when you do it to be 1 upon 30 what this answer comes to be is it comes to be 0 0.03 okay into 10 to the power minus 3 centimeter now uh, you can also write 3.33 into 10 to the power minus 5 centimeter let's say i want to convert it to nanometer so in terms of nanometer we multiply it by 10 to the power 7 so it comes out to be 3.33 into 10 to the power 2 and therefore it will be 333.3 in uh, nanometer okay so what where does this lie now we can also say see uh, from uh, the electromagnetic spectrum when you divide the visible uh, range is approximately we take it from 400 to 800 nanometer but precisely talking it starts from somewhere 380 or 375 to 790 or 7 uh, nanometer so below that we have uv range ultraviolet range so this uh, for this wave number of transition this region corresponds to the ultraviolet range in the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay, so this is the answer to this question. Basically, uh, if you remember the relation, uh, you can directly write the answer in third, uh, in centimeter inverse. But uh, uh, if you want to convert the same to in terms of nanometer and then find the answer, if you are given such type of question, you just need to convert it to wave length and then find the region which it corresponds to okay now uh, the what uh, we'll go to the if you have any doubt in this question just ask or else we'll go to the next question okay so we'll go to the next question that is if the refractive index of a medium is higher than that of air, speed of light through the medium will be. Okay. So, see. Uh, refractive index is what? Refractive index, uh, if you go by definition, refractive index is the sine of angle of in incidence upon sine of angle of refraction. Right? So, and if you talk about refractive index in terms of velocity, refractive index is velocity. of light in vacuum upon velocity in the material or substance okay 
so if the refractive index of the material is higher than that of the air speed of light in that medium will be okay so uh, what uh, since we can also say that the velocity of light in any medium uh, say vacuum is quite higher and uh, compared to that the velocity also um, increases if it is it moves in a, a rare medium so if the refractive index of the medium is higher the speed of light what it has relation with that of the uh, medium say yeah so if the refractive index is higher compared to air then the speed of light will be speed of light in that medium will be see this has an inverse relation the refractive index is higher the velocity will be lower right if the refractive index of the medium is higher than that of the air the speed of light through that medium will be because the lower the value the higher the refractive index the lower the value of velocity the higher will be the refractive index so speed of light in that medium will be lower okay uh, actually this is quite easy question which and this uh, the thing refractive index we have been discussing earlier also like uh, sorry we haven't discussed it earlier but we have studied this in the lower classes and this is the relation it has with the velocity and uh, how does it change in this module only we had studied how the refractive index changes and how the change in refractive index is also responsible for the non-linear optical phenomenon so with this we'll go to the question number three what is the magic angle of polarization uh do you have any answer for this uh what is the magic angle for polarization okay so the magic angle for the polarization is okay here i have missed the degree too okay just think and answer because it's easy we have discussed this so uh, why is this angle called magic angle of polarization because at this angle there is no change with respect to the polarization of the beam so if you keep something at this angle you will not observe any change so the angle for this is 54.7 degrees okay with respect to the incident beam you need to keep something at 50 if you keep it as 54.7 degree you will not find any change in the polarization this is why it is called the magic angle of polarization okay the next is a horizontal beam of pulsed laser light is reflected by a retro reflector in order to bring about a delay of 14 femtoseconds the retro reflector has to be moved by okay Just try to remember this question. We have solved this question, and we have solved it with a very easy technique. So it is not that much difficult to solve this question. Say, what does a ref retro reflector does? See, this is a light, a beam of light that goes straight to it. It has a system of two mirrors. Say, these are lying perpendicular to each other. when the light say is incident on this we just remove this in a part of time and the light goes back through this way 
okay the light is reflected at 90 degrees and at 90 degrees to each other and this is the reflected ray now suppose i want the delay so i want the light to uh, the reflected beam to come late say so i want uh, so what i need to do is i need to shift this retro reflector back now if i shift this back to through some distance say this and this this is l this is l say this is 2l so if i shift it by this much uh, distance i can get a delay of time that is whatever i need say it is femto 14 femtoseconds in this case now uh, there is a normal relation which of distance and speed say the pulse laser light it has velocity the velocity of this light is of order 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second right now uh, also there is one more thing which is given to us that is the total distance the total distance is say x now at this moment we do not have the value of x we can just say that the total distance is x now what do we want we want a delay the delay should be of 14 femtoseconds what is a femtosecond earlier also we have discussed the femtosecond is 14 into 10 to the power minus 15 seconds okay 14 into 10 to the power minus 15 seconds is femtoseconds order so basically you want a delay you have a velocity and you have the distance so since you know the speed you can also predict the uh, distance whatever you need to move finally what you will do is you will just do the half of the distance and uh, by that distance only you will move the retro reflector okay so uh, speed is equals to distance on time and distance is equals to speed into time so here this relation the velocity was 3 into 10 to the power 8 here i'll write the unit meter second inverse multiplied by time that was 14 femtoseconds so into 10 to the power minus 15 i'll just write okay and what is the unit that is second second to second inverse will be cancelled and 14 threes are would be 42 into 10 to the power minus uh, four, uh minus 7 okay uh and the unit is meter if i want to convert it to uh, say angstrom it would be 420 into 10 no, no, no. don't convert it to angstrom you can also write in terms of nanometer as 0. Point, no, no, no. you can write it as Achha, converting you know, from meter to nanometer we multiply it by 10 to the power 9 so it will be okay we can write it in terms of micrometer also let uh, first we'll convert to nanometer if we want to convert to nanometer what will be the answer into 10 to the power minus 9 will 10 to the power plus 9 will do it will come to be 10 to the power 2 and therefore 4200 nanometer this will be the answer if you want to convert the same to micrometer you can convert it to by dividing by 1000 or 10 to the power 3 so you will get an answer of 4.2 micrometer now see i told you the distance what you will get is the sum of these two okay so distance what you calculated from the formula is 2L is equals to 4.2 micrometer. Okay, now by what distance you should move is, is half of it. So it is 4.2 upon 2 and the answer will come to be 2.1 micrometer. Okay, should be moved by. So the answer to this question is 2.1 micrometer. Further, uh, we have few more questions left but uh, if you have any doubt in this question we can discuss
okay so we uh, we we can further proceed to the next question the question is 37% of the light incident on a sample is absorbed the absorbance of the sample is okay so light incident is absorbed now in terms of percentage if we are talking so intensity of the absorbed light is 37% we need to calculate the absorbance okay there is a direct relation that is absorbance is equals to log of i not upon i okay now see what is this i this i is equals to intensity of transmitted light if you want to talk about the absorbed light c uh, the intensity since we know one more relation that the total intensity will be the sum of intensity of absorbed light plus intensity of the transmitted light so if you want to calculate ia so ia's relation will be i not minus i t right here we are given with i t so i t will also be equal to i not minus i a and if we do not have the value of i two i t then also it's not a problem we can just keep in the formula the value of i a uh, the value of total value in terms of i a so let's say the total intensity of light absorbed is hundred and i a will write as i not minus i a okay so it will be log 100 upon i not what is i not i not is 100 minus what is ia ia is 37 if you do the uh, calculated log of 100 upon log of 100 minus 37 so it comes to be 3 and uh, 63 so we'll just calculate the answer for this okay so it comes to be log of 1.587 so the answer is 0 0.200 okay this is a simple question uh and let's say we vary the absorb uh, sorry now we have got to know that the absorbance say which is denoted by a which is also given by the relation epsilon into c into l it is also written as log of i naught upon i and its value has in this case has come to be 0 0.8 okay so uh, with this we have covered some re uh, revision questions also we have also covered some uh, question, uh, all the questions which were in the assignment. We have discussed their solution. We have also discussed all the necessary extra information which was necessary. And if you have any doubt in any of these questions, you can feel you can ask, or else we'll just uh, finish this session. Okay, so with this we'll finish the session. Everyone, thank you so much for joining.